now. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Humanist Association of Oregon's August meeting. And um, visitors and members attending your first meeting are especially welcome, especially our Kiwi who got up at all hours to join us today. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm uh, part of the association's events team. And also we have uh, Ruth this evening who is doing co-host. And before we begin our meetings, we always give a brief definition of humanism. Humanism is a simple philosophy. It is an ethical life stance which focuses on human values, being good without God. It is about taking responsibility and treating, treating others with respect while living our one life. Now, if you would like a more in-depth description and the statement of the fundamental principles of modern humanism, otherwise known as the Amsterdam Declaration, is available online. Uh, we will be having a Q&A session after the presentation. And um, so if you'd like to take part in that, even uh, during um, the session here, you can uh, raise your hand and uh, we will get to you. Now, finally this evening, just for um, the new people that have joined us, uh, the event itself is being recorded for YouTube. So if you're the shy type and you're worrying about your face uh, showing up, you can just click the camera off by clicking the camera symbol on your screen. Right, so. And uh, Nikki Kavanagh has been doing the work of a doula for the last 14 years and is currently in formal training for the role. Doula is the name given to someone who is a midwife, or in the case of an end of life doula, a midwife or a companion for death. As we are hopefully on the cusp of a sea change in our society regarding attitudes towards death, it is high time to discuss the highlight and highlight the caregiving offered by doulas. Uh, thankfully, we had one such deal in attendance at our March meeting, and our contribution during the Q&A session generated a lot of interest from the people who are also in attendance. So, as requested, we have invited Nikki back to tell us more about the role and her experience as an end-of-life doula. So, uh, Nikki, I think you're unmuted there, so thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for such a lovely introduction, Tony. Uh, my name is Nikki, everybody. Um, I'm 52 years of age and I work as an end of life doula in Ireland. Um, and this, this is something that's relatively new, but it's also something that's relatively old, as doula is an ancient term that refers to midwife. Um, most people would have heard of birth doulas, but not very many have heard of death doulas or end of life doulas, which some people prefer that term. Um, now, basically, what a doula is there is to hold space for somebody who is in the final stages of their life um, or who is actively dying or somebody who is preparing for death at the end of their life. They don't necessarily need to be terminal. Sometimes people like to prepare in such a way as if you would for uh, as you would prefer a uh, prepare for a birth, for example. Um, we do an awful lot of preparation for birth, but uh, we don't do an awful lot of preparation at all for death. In fact, in, in most cases, we really don't do any. Um, we, don't, we don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. Um, the conversations are very difficult. People don't know what to say to people that are dying. Um, and it's important, it's so important that people are given the opportunity to have what we like to refer to as a good death. Um, a good death is very easy to have. Um, it just takes a little bit of planning, it just takes a little bit of time. And um, in any case, whether the, the person who's dying is a terminal case or if they're dying of natural causes, um, you can really do an awful lot to help. And that's what doulas do. Uh, doulas can take over uh, a number of jobs that might not be too that patients don't really want to have to do. The first job um, would be as a liaison between medical and patient because an awful lot of very sick people who get a terminal diagnosis, when they're given the diagnosis, they don't really take in um, what's been said. A lot of the time they don't want family members with them because they don't want their family members upset. Mm. A lot of the time they don't have family members to have with them. Um, and having somebody to go with you and sit through when you're getting your diagnosis, is, it's, it's so important. And um, so that's one of the first things that we might do for somebody. Um, after that, we, we pretty much will do anything that um, the dying person requires. Uh, companionship is one of the things that is very important as a doula. 
um, holding space for the person who's dying and make sh- making sure that they have their needs met as opposed to their family's needs or their doctor's needs, that, that their needs are met. Um, because all too often it, it, it ends up being a doctor's decision what happens or another family member's decision what happens at the very end of life. And we find it important that uh, people are allowed the autonomy to choose um, and to choose how they die if possible, if at all possible. Um, so that's basically what we're about. I'm going to tell you about um, my first proper experience as a doula. Um, I didn't know I was a doula at the time. I didn't know that's what it was called. Uh, but I was called upon by my best friend, who was 55 at the time, and had been feeling rather ill and had been called into the hospital for tests and was called in for his test results and rang me and asked me if I would accompany him to the hospital. So we went to the hospital and we met with his doctor and his doctor told him he had stage four lung cancer that had metastasized into his brain and his liver and his blood and his bones. Um, and he had a scan up on the screen and you could see by the scan on the screen that, that the cancer was absolutely everywhere. Um, so Dave, Dave nodded his head and, and said, I, yep, I understand, I get you, I, I hear you. And, uh, and we left the hospital. And as we stood outside, I asked him, did he understand what he'd just been told? And he said, yep. And I said, what, what do you understand about what you've been told? And he said, I have a big fight on my hands. So I thought, OK, I, I wasn't really sure how to handle this because I, I, I knew that any fight that he, he had in him wasn't really going to do very much to extend his life because the cancer had already spread so far throughout his bo- body. And the consultant had made it very clear that this was a terminal case. So he was offered treatment, palliative treatment um, in the form of chemotherapy. Um, As anybody who has gone through uh, any kind of cancer treatment with anybody else, they'll know the chemotherapy is extremely harsh. Um, It's a poison. It poisons your whole body, not not just the cancer. And Mm -hmm. the best case scenario can give you extra time. But in a case like Dave's, when there is no hope and when all the tumours are so far advanced, they gave him the option, I think, to put his mind at rest, to give him some hope. And they gave him the option to have some chemotherapy to see if they could extend his life, because at the time he was only given three months to live. So Dave decided he'd have one dose of chemotherapy and see how it went and make a decision after that as to whether he should proceed or not. Dave is always a very slight man, um, skinny, um, really. He had grand mal epilepsy and he had to take an awful lot of medication and it, it interfered with his appetite he didn't eat an awful lot and um, so he was very thin to begin with but within the space of a week the difference in, in him was startling and um, he had his first chemo treatment and it made him so sick it made him so sick that he couldn't get out of bed he could hardly speak um he he was very, very, very ill. So he took he took the decision not to have any more treatment. And um, that was when he asked me, he, he told me that he, he really didn't want to go into the hospice and he really didn't want to be in a hospital and die in a hospital. So I asked him what it was he wanted. And he told me he wanted to die in his own bed, in his own home with me as his best friend there to care for him. Now, Dave's family live in England and we live in Ireland. And he hadn't told his family the extent of his illness because his mother had lost his father only a year beforehand to the same illness. And he was very upset that um, his mother wouldn't be able to cope. So he found it very difficult to tell her what was happening. So he was diagnosed in November. And at Christmas time, he had deteriorated to the point that I took a picture of him to send to his family so that they could see how ill he was because Dave wasn't telling them the truth on the phone. And I didn't feel it was my place 
to get on the phone demanding that they come and spend time with their son. But I felt they should know how close he actually was to dying because it was very clear from the photograph that he was close to dying. Um, so his sister contacted me. Um, it took the family a, quite a few weeks to get their act together and, and to get over to see Dave. In fact, it, it, they got there two days before he died. And they had perhaps two hours with him while he was still conscious, which was very upsetting for me. Um, but Dave got what he wanted. He wanted to watch Game of Thrones from the very beginning, which he did. <laughs> and he didn't want to be in any pain, which he wasn't. Um, the hospice, which he was assigned to, which is Our Lady's Hospice in Harold's Cross, supplied nurses who supplied the medication that was required because I am a non-medical personnel and I did everything else. So he had a catheter put in, which I was very confused about at the time because they told me that his kidneys had stopped working and I wondered why there was need of a catheter if he wasn't producing urine, which as it turned out he wasn't and the catheter was just something um, that was causing him pain and made him very uncomfortable. So I got the catheter removed. Um, he didn't have any extra oxygen. He didn't have anything except a morphine pump, but he didn't go through any severe difficulties. Um, he died very peacefully in his bed with his family around him and me and another carer, Neil, at his side. And it was very peaceful and it was very calm. And we had music that he liked playing in the background. Uh, we had Game of Thrones constantly on the television because every time he opened his eyes, he'd give out if it wasn't on the television. So we had Game of Thrones playing constantly in the background. We had his favorite things around him and um, he was only unconscious for one day and, and then he passed very quietly in his sleep. So he had what we would call a, a good death. There was um, minimal medical invasion um, and maximum comfort for Dave. And that's what we aim really for, is to give people the maximum comfort at home. Now, the difference between a doula and a family member is that obviously a doula isn't as emotionally attached to the loved one as a family member is. And sometimes family members don't have a very clear head when it comes to care decisions um, for their loved ones. Um, also, people that are dying, if they have a, a death plan worked out or an end of life plan indeed worked out, um, they can make it very clear without having to do, without having to have too many difficult conversations, what it is that they want. Um, and the doula is then available to have those convert the difficult conversations with the family to explain what their loved one requires from them um, during the dying process. Um, grief is also something that we deal an awful lot with. And in our training, grief is one of the very first things that we have to face. We have to face our own grief because most of us um, have suffered trauma and grief in, in one form or another. And I speak of most of us as human beings. Um, I also speak, as most of us as doulas, will have had some form of trauma that has perhaps directed them in this direction for work. Um, we have to face our own trauma before we can face anybody else's. So that's a very huge part of our training, is looking at our own grief and our own trauma and exploring that very deeply and coming to terms with our own grief and our own trauma. So I've gone through that process and I'm continuing to go through that process at the moment. Um, a little bit about my background with death. Um, I, I was introduced to death when I was eight and my very wonderful grandmother died um, suddenly and very unexpectedly. Um, she was only 68 and she died of a heart attack. And at the time she was like a second mother to me. I was very, very close to her and I didn't understand really what was going on. Um, just that I was never going to see her again. And when I heard that she had died and I realized what it meant, my initial reaction was, um, was very uh, 
wild, I suppose you could call it. It, it, it was a very honest reaction. And, and I, I screamed um, a lot um, and roared um, and cried and made an awful lot of noise, which didn't help my grieving mother, um, but seemed to do something for me. It helped me uh, a little bit, I think. And that's something that we've forgotten how to do when it comes to mourning. Uh, I wear a green, I don't know if you can see it, I wear a, a, a green scarf, which I received at the end of my in-house training, if you like, um, uh, um, with my teacher as a symbol of the work that I do. And it's, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, an homage to Scottish keeners, um, which are still, still working in Scotland. Um, ladies that are uh, professional grievers that will come to a graveside and keen their loss um, oh, for your loved one. And that tends to open up an, an awful lot of grief in people who will then find it easier to express that grief themselves. Um, because we live in a death phobic society, which is, is what I call it, we're, we're totally death phobic, uh, thanks to the Hippocratic Oath and the intervention of church. Um, we, we tend to we tend to dismiss death, it's hidden away. Uh, we don't talk about it. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to refer to it. Uh, I have an elderly relative who's in his seventies and with everything going on in the world at the moment, um, I thought he would be one of the first in the queue to be vaccinated against this pandemic. But to my utter surprise, um, he declared that he was fit and healthy, that um, people don't die from this disease unless they're unfit, um, and that if he did catch COVID, he wouldn't die from it, he'd get better. And that was that. So I was a bit concerned about him because I felt he didn't really understand uh, what the word pandemic means and what is actually happening with COVID because as a sort of a frontline worker, I've seen for myself the devastation that COVID has caused in the world, unfortunately. Um, I tried to explain to him that I'd seen it for myself. Uh, I said, I, I've tended to people who are dying of this disease. And he said, of COVID? And I said, yes, of COVID. And he said, I, I don't want to speak about that. I don't want to talk about it. Um, and he doesn't want to talk about death in any form or in any way. And I suppose some people, that's the way that they deal with it because that's the way they've been taught to deal with it. It's not spoken about. If we go back a little bit in time, the Victorians were fantastic at dealing with death. Um, they, 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 in fact, they, they made it part of everyday life, which really, if you think about it, is, is what it is. We all have to do it. And it's part of our life, whether we like it or not. Um, it might be the very last part of our life, but it's still part of our life. And I think it's important that we have some sort of control over um, how we go and doulas can help with that where possible. In some cases, it's not possible. In some cases, people have to be connected to machinery or they choose to be connected to machinery to try and extend their life for a, a loved one to get here from some other country or for whatever reason they may want to extend their life. They may be on machines. Uh, we can also help in those cases too. Um, we can help the family by explaining what's happening to their loved one during the death process which of course doctors are also able to do. Um, but I think doulas are able to do it with a little bit more care um, because it's focused primarily on one person and the doulas focuses entirely on one person and that person only when they're dying. So that person is the most important person in the room, not the relatives or the doctors or anybody else in the room. The person who's dying is the person who is the most important person in the room. And their wishes are the one that we try to adhere to as much as possible. Um, acceptance is uh, so very important when, when, you're, when you're thinking about planning for your death. Uh, I think acceptance is one of the very first things is we, we have to accept that we're going to die. So many, so many people do not accept this fact of life that uh, we are going to die. One day we're, we're going to die and it's not a day of our knowing. Uh, we don't get to choose when we die. Uh, we always say, you know, uh, you know, well, in a few years, I'm thinking of doing this or in, in a couple more years, I'm thinking of doing that. And we don't really know if we have a couple more years, which is why doulas aren't 
aren't just there for the dying process. Um, they can also help you to assess your situation, to assess your life, to get in place your, your plan before anything happens to you. Um, and be called upon then later when the time comes um, to be your companion at the time when you when you need a companion by your side to advocate for you. Um, I'm just trying to, I have a few notes written down here. I've, there's a few things I, I, I wanted to talk about, to, I just wanted to touch on. Uh, we've lost um, our ancestors, um, which is something that as doulas, we find very important ancestry where we come from, who we are, um, rites and rituals that belong to our families in generations past. Um, rites and rituals are, are so important around death because they help the family um, to feel connected to the death. If, if you're able to perform ceremony around the death during the time of death, it also gives the family um, something to hold on to and makes them feel that they're doing something rather than just standing by and watching their loved one die. And um, so we like to introduce a certain amount of ceremony, um, perhaps by using incense if the person hasn't got a problem with breathing or um, essential oils in the room, perhaps by playing a beautiful piece of music. And um, there are some wonderful pieces of music out there that I, I, I can recommend if people want to ask later. Um, there are all kinds of things. If, if, if your loved one can't be at home if they have to be in a hospital you can bring in their favorite blanket or their or their favorite pillow and um, photographs from home and um, there are so many things we can do to make our loved ones feel better you can sing them you can sing them out you know when their time is coming everybody can get together and sing a favorite song or a family song or a song that your loved one loves there are just so many ways to face into um and deal with death that people just don't think about because they don't want to talk about the D word. And um, so that's why I'm here today is to talk about the D word. Um, we don't we don't have we don't we don't have generations anymore in this modern world. We have decades now. Um, generations seem to have gone by the wayside and uh, we've lost the wisdom of our elders. There's a, a very interesting gentleman called Stephen Jenkinson, a Canadian gentleman. I don't know if anybody has heard of him. Um, there's a documentary on YouTube about him called Grief Walker. He's a wise man, if ever I heard one. Um, I take a lot of my learning from him. He has a school in Canada um, called the Orphan School, Orphan School of Wisdom. And he teaches about the lack of ancestry, um, especially in a country like America, where a lot of the population have comes from so many different countries that they no longer have any ancestry or uh, past to turn to. So we're losing a, an awful lot of traditions and we're losing an, an awful lot of rights around death. Um, a lot of the old rights that we used to have around deaths are, can be very symbolic and very helpful. So there are a lot of pagan ceremonies. There, there are a lot of things that families can do and be included in when it comes to death and dying. Um, also during death, um, as I said, there's singing, there's humming, um, which is uh, very helpful and very calming. There are, there are so many things you can do to make a loved one more comfortable and feel more peaceful while they are dying. And there are also things we can do after the person has died. Um, a lot of people don't realize that it is not necessary to call an undertaker um, a lot of people think, oh, my gosh, they're dead. Ring the undertaker. We have to go and get, get it sorted out right now. Um, uh, and because that's 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 what is tr tradition in most European Western countries is you ring the undertaker. He takes the body away. He embalms them. He puts makeup on them, puts the clothes you've given them on them and, and puts them into a nice coffin for you to come and see them and feel comfortable while you're seeing them. Most of the time that's done in silence because people feel um, in it, the room is always very quiet. There might be some, some gentle music playing in the background. People are all whispering. Um, and again, there's no opportunity to show your grief um, because you feel kind of, people might look at us funny if, if we start crying or wailing or, or, or getting upset um, that, that, that people might look funny at us. Um, we, we need to be allowed to grieve. Um, 
I think that's what that, that's one of the things that we're, we're no, we no longer do. We don't grieve properly anymore. We don't know what to do. We go to the pub and get drunk um, and, and just talk about the person when, when there's so many other things you can do before the body even leaves the house. Um, we like the idea of family looking after the body. Um, so we like the idea of washing the person who's passed, um, maybe using essential oils um, and rubbing it into their skin to keep their skin supple and for a nice smell in the room. Um, we also like the idea of the, if the family wants to be involved, we love the idea of shrouding, um, natural shrouding or dressing somebody in something that they had chosen to die in and wanted to wear upon their death. Um, there, there are so many, many, many things that we can do while our loved one is still in front of us before they go to the funeral parlor, if indeed they actually have to go to the funeral parlor. Um, when Dave died, he was in no way religious and his family refused to participate in the funeral. So I was left in a position where I had to officiate a funeral and I, I'd never ever done anything remotely like that before. My best friend had just died. I, I didn't know how a funeral service should be done. Um, oh gosh, I rambled. Uh, I rambled an awful lot. Um, but I told everybody, I told everybody about Dave. I told them funny stories about Dave because there were a lot of funny stories about Dave. And I did the whole thing myself. Um, I chose the cheapest coffin because he didn't want me to spend any money. Um, turns out it wasn't a wicker coffin. Um, I thought that would be the cheapest option, but it isn't. Um, I discovered an awful lot of things when, when going through this first experience uh, about dying and the business of death um, and your choices uh, in, in, in how you basically dispose of, of your loved one's body, how, how it, whether you cremate or bury. Um, there, there are more choices available than we know. Natural burial has become a thing now. Um, where people are buried shrouded um, in a natural fabric such as silk or linen and a tree planted on top of them. We have one green graveyard in Ireland. I do believe it's in, it's either Wexford or Waterford. I think it's Wexford. I'll have to check that. Um, where it's a totally natural uh, green burial place and where every person is buried, a tree is planted on top. So when the patch of land that is being used for green burial is finished, that there will be forest in its place, um, natural woods in its place. So we're renewing the earth, which is really what we're supposed to be doing anyway. Um, what else do I want to talk to you about? Oh, the Hippocratic Oath. That's become a big problem. Um, doctors have to take an oath where they declare that they will do no harm and they they have to follow that oath no matter what happens to you or to your loved one or how ill you get or they have to try and save you they have to try and extend your life they have to give you that option because they're not allowed to do anything else and um, they're not allowed when for example a person who's dying of cancer has gone into a coma and is no, there's no longer any chance of them coming back. I thought at that stage that a doctor would be able to perhaps help on the person who is in the bed to, to move past this life and onto their next one. And, um, and they can't, they're not allowed to do that. They can't give them an extra dose of morphine. Um, they can't help them on their way. Uh, you just have to wait until their heart stops, basically. And I find this is a very distressing thing for families to go through. So um, we, we, ad we advocate, obviously, uh, very, very strongly for the right to die with dignity um, and very much um, the right to die your way and not your doctor's way or your daughter's way or your priest's way, or your anybody's way, but your way. Oh, thank you for that, near Enniscorthy. Thank you, whoever posted that. 
Uh, the natural burial ground is near Enniscorthy. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in talks with a few people that own land around the country, trying to persuade them actually to use their land as natural burial grounds. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of things like that happening. I know in Holland at the moment, there's a gentleman experimenting <laughs> with uh, fungi. He's growing coffins. Um, he grows them. He grows them in a in a in a in a box shape, and they can then be used as uh, natural coffins. So there there are all kinds of things going on in the world at the moment to try and make death a more natural thing, and and to make it less poisonous to our planet as well, because we're filling our planet with formaldehyde at the moment. Um, for everybody that we bury, um, and for everybody that we burn, there's all kinds of toxins going into the air. So. Natural death and, and burial is something that we would very much advocate as, as a group. I believe, I think I speak for, for most of us anyhow. Um, but generally speaking, at the end of the day, it's, it's the person who's dying who is the important person or the person who wants to plan their death, who is the important person. And I'm merely there to facilitate that and to do whatever I can to help that person to get the death that they would like to have and do whatever I can to help the family to grieve that death. Um, I also visit afterwards. Um, I, I, I worked with another gentleman in September and October of last year. His, his wife had cancer and was diagnosed with COVID and unfortunately ended up dying in the hospital, which was um, what nobody, uh, nobody wanted. Um, and the only way I could help was to give them language to speak to the doctors, to enable them to get actually into the room so they could be with her when she died because they weren't allowing people into the hospital rooms um, because of COVID. Even though this lady was in, was in isolation because she had cancer, she was now clear of COVID, but they still wouldn't let anybody into the room. Um, so thankfully I had, I had enough knowledge and language to give to them that they were in, they were, able to get into the room and they were able to spend the last four or five days with their loved one in the hospital um, while she died. So while they didn't get her home, they, uh, they at least had that. And in, in this time, I think that's the most important thing at the moment is, is just being able to be there. Um, I think that's pretty much, I know there's going to be quite a few questions um, because I know I, I had quite a lot of questions when, when I first started this. Um, I might explain a little bit about, uh, before I go, about, about how I got in, into all this. Um, when, when my grandmother died, um, I didn't go to her funeral because my, my mum felt I was too young and it wasn't appropriate. And it turned out that wasn't really a good idea um, because the grief that I went through then was, um, it went on forever. It still, it still goes on. I still live with the grief of, uh, and the trauma of losing my grandmother, even though I'm 52 now. I was only eight when she died. And I still talk to her every day and miss her every day. And it, it was very traumatic for me because I wasn't able to say goodbye. So children in, in death is, an, is, is another thing that, um, you know, children should be allowed to, they, they should be introduced to, to death as or, when their grandparents are dying, they should be allowed to witness that, um, in my opinion personally, in my opinion, um, that they should be introduced as early as possible so that they understand it is a natural thing and it's not something to be scared of, that it's something that everybody goes through. Now, um, uh, I think, oh, I was going to talk a little bit about how I got into this. Um, Dave was my first, I suppose, big, big case. But before that, I found myself um, always involved in family funerals. Um, I, to take the load off everybody else, I always got involved in all, any of my family or friends who have died in the last 20 years, I've been involved in one form or another in, in their funerals, whether it be doing their makeup or, or arranging the service or looking after them while they die or whatever it is that I can offer to my family and my friends at that time, that's what, that's what I've been there to do. But now that I've chosen to do it um, as a life path, I understand, I've come to understand so much more about death and dying and um, about humanity in general. Um, and humanity is the, is, it, it is the biggest word in all of this, is, is that we, 
we need compassion and humanity um, for people who are dying, no matter who they are or where they've been or what they've done. Um, I, I tried to offer my services to a local hospice because I know there are people that um, die alone, that don't have people to sit with them, um, that are, are dying in hospices or in hospitals on their own. And I, I can't, to me, that, that thought is, is it's atrocious and nobody should have to die alone without somebody there to hold their hand and, and, and stroke their face and tell them they're loved and tell them it's okay. Um, so I offered my services at a local hospice and they turned me down because I was non-religious and because they had a chaplain that was there to do all those things. So um, I asked a very naughty question and um, I asked quite facetiously if everybody that went to their hospice was um, a, a religious person. And he, he they, they, they did take pause on that and say, well, we get your point. No, no, not everybody is religious, but we, we, we do have chaplains here to cater uh, for that. So I, do, I just hope that um, they have chaplains to cater for everybody that dies and that they don't all die at the same time any day. Because otherwise there's going to be people that are left dying on their own. And what I want to do today is to just explain to you wonderful people who have come to listen to me speak today that we are here. There are now, have you heard of permission? Promission. No, I have not, Jennifer. Um, an environmentally friendly, I don't know what that is. Perhaps when we come to the question and answer uh, portion, which will be just in a few minutes now, um, that would be something we could, I've never heard of that, Jennifer. That I'd be very interested in hearing about what that is. Um, now I've forgotten what I was going to say. Yes, your death is the very last thing that you, you can have control of in, in your life. So, um, for me, it's very important um, that you take control now and don't wait un until you're told that you're actually in the process of dying before you decide to make any kind of plans. Uh, doulas are available in Ireland now, thankfully. We have 24 fully trained doulas under the Sacred Circle. Circle. Um, they used to be called Red Tent. That's who I trained under. Um, they're a sacred circle that do training for birth and death doulas. They also do training for celebrants and other non-religious roles um, in the death care community. Um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. Um, they care so much about humanity and I care so much about humanity, which is why I am, I'll do that Nadine. I will give you an email address that anybody who is interested in doing courses or in contacting a doula. Um, I will give you an email address at the end of this that is our, our kind of center of contact um, for, for our, uh, our circle. It, it's Sacred Circle, they're called. Um, I'll just give it to you now briefly. It's sacredcircle, C-I-C at gmail.com. Um, you can also find me, um, Nikki Kavanagh, on Facebook, um, and I can direct you in a number of directions if you're looking for a doula anywhere throughout England or Ireland. Um, I think that's about all, Tony. If you want to open the floor, I'm happy to answer any questions. Absolutely, yeah. And thanks for that, Nikki. You have to say now, you shared so much more with us than just to simply the role of a doula, and it was incredible to listen to. So thank you very, very much. Um, do we have any uh, questions? Uh, Ruth, do we have any hands up at the moment? So uh, we had lots of comments passed about people not realising that, uh, for instance, that there were, as you mentioned, other options for funerals that didn't involve being necessarily put in a, a, a wooden a container. Uh, I think it was Jennifer said, wicker coffins are quite ex are expensive, quite the status symbol. Um, then a mention again of the natural burial ground near Enniscorthy. Um, oh yes, uh, Phil has asked, and I know you, you touched on it, but perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about your training. I know you mentioned Sacred Circle, but a few questions about um, what the training entails, I guess, and and are they Irish based, European based? Are they an international group? Um, no, they're 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 UK and Irish based. 
um, they they're the I think they're the only people that are doing the training at the moment in Ireland. Uh, they are called Sacred Circle. Um, they do training all over Ireland. Um, I did my training in um, during a they basically hold retreats. Um, a five, usually a four or a five day retreat where your initial training, if you like, is done. And your training would consist of learning what it is that you have to have within you to be able to do the work uh, that you're being asked to do. Um, we're taught how to expose our own grief. We're taught how to look into our own grief. That's when self-care is one of the most important things we learn about because in order, you can't look after anybody else if you haven't looked after yourself. And if, if you get, obviously it's, it's quite a motive of the work um, and not everybody can do it. It's, it's, a, it's a very specialized job and you have to be comfortable with death and dying in order to be able to do that. Um, is, it, is it a professional qualification or is it possible that if somebody felt that they were able to and had it in them that they could do they could carry out the tasks of a doula as you've described it without necessarily having the training done, for instance. Well, my first experience, I had no training. Well, mm -hmm. Dave, my friend who died um, when he was 55, I, I had, I had, all I had was love mm -hmm. and, yeah. and compassion. And, and that's really, you know, that's the first two things that you need to be a doula uh, are, are, is, is a great love and, and compassion for humanity. I think we have we have two raised hands uh, so far. So I'm going to ask uh, Rosie McAdam. Rosie, if you can unmute your microphone and uh, you can ask your question directly then to Nikki. Yeah, no, it's the same. <coughs> yeah, no, I just think it's a it's a great thing to offer. I think I've uh, I've always been extremely independent in my life. Um, and when I was a kid, I spent a lot of time in hospital. And I was there on my own. I didn't have family around me. So I would always, um, the doctors knew exactly what I wanted uh, in regards to the care. Um, and I'd make it very clear. And uh, to the point that if they didn't follow my instructions, I'd tell them I'd do a bit of weaning of my own or peening um, and scream the hospital down. So they would. Um, but I think the end of life thing, um, that independence can be taken away from people. I think family members can get very emotional and, you know, decide to take over uh, what your wants and needs are. So I think having someone like a doula is very good for, you know, a lot of people if, you know, at, at times like that when you can't, maybe can't express totally what you want to have somebody there who's an advocate and who's completely impartial. I think it's a great thing. Yeah. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Rosie. Well, you're making a statement, really, when you hire a doula. Um, you're saying to your family and friends that um, you have this covered, um, that the, all they have to do is is love you. Um, that's all they have to do, that they don't need to be responsible for anything else. Because is there a possibility that a family member or the entire family might say, no, we, we you know, let's say the, the person in question may be... Um, unresponsive at that stage but still alive is there a possibility that a family could overrule you and of course in the role that yeah of course i i have no i have no legal standing unless i'm given that legal standing by the by the client themselves and um, and you you would you do find though with most families if there is a doula involved the whole family is on board okay and um, because the doula kind of becomes part of the family for a little while because they don't just care for the person in the bed. They're also helping the family that are trying to come to terms with their loved one dying. And you're doing a, you're, you're being a shoulder for, for, for others as well. But you're, you're, you're mostly there just to make sure, just to make sure that you advocate for that, for, for, for the person who's dying. Thank you. We have a question as well, a raised hand from Jennifer Sturgeon. Jennifer, if you can unmute your microphone, please. And uh, what question would you like to ask Nikki? Uh, well, not so much a question. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much, Nikki. Really uh, uh, appreciate you talking to us tonight. And um, I think it's a wonderful service, very humane thing that you're doing. Um, I did put up a little comment about Promesian. And I just wanted to say a wee bit about that. 
Um, up here in Northern Ireland, the Human Association of Northern Ireland, we had a talk uh, a month ago uh, from a guy who told us all about this process. Um, it was developed in Sweden, and I don't know that they do much of it anywhere in the world at the moment, but you can Google it and you can look it up. It was devised by a Swedish uh, biologist, and it basically involves freeze drying the body and then rendering it into a powder, which can then, um, it, which it, when put into the ground is apparently much more environmentally friendly than the ashes or the pellets you get after cremation. So uh, it intrigued me. I hadn't heard of it before until about a month ago. And it seems to me that it's something that we should maybe learn more about and maybe try and promote. Um, I don't know about the cost of it all, probably quite expensive, but I think it's something worth exploring as an environmentally friendly alternative to cremation and burials. Thank you, Jennifer. That sounds fantastic, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard of that, Jennifer. That, uh, well, certainly I'm going to look into that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, heard of, I heard of one uh, recently. I read an article um, on the Washington Post not to sound all braggy that I'm reading the Washington Post, it obviously knew that I was interested in these things. There is um, research been done whereby, and I, I don't want to use my words crudely, but um, the deceased is interred in a way where it, the microbiome would break it down, but not in the way that you described, Nikki. It seemed to be almost in an individual unit. And then the, the remaining, again, and I, I'm, I'm careful with my words, but the remaining remains essentially is added to the soil and that seems to be even a lesser you know you wouldn't have to necessarily pay for bridges for freeze drying things uh, deceased or, or things like that that's another don't know what it's called but i know if you google it you'll come across a place in washington that does it um we have another raised hand as well uh, liz bayfield liz would you uh, unmute your microphone and uh, yeah hi, hi nikki um thank hi, liz you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I, I kind of uh, went through a few years ago the death of my mother and a few years before and accompanying her to um, appointments and helping her to understand choices, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, at the same time, I'd been working as a volunteer with AWARE, so had had very good training around listening um, that... Um, you know, that I wasn't particularly good at actually before I went through that training. But I found, you know, as we came to the end of life and stuff like that, that um, I was able to use that training of listening to hear what my mother was saying in a way that maybe my siblings weren't hearing because they didn't want to hear what she was saying because, you know, they were upset that she might be giving up, et cetera, et cetera. And um, sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional talking okay. about it, but it's actually hard to be a family member to do it, to then explain to others her choices. Um, and it's, you know, and, and, and the family member can actually be quite resentful that you're, you're kind of, they feel like, well, you're giving up with her kind of thing, et cetera. So I can just see how valuable it would be to have somebody who's, you know, as invested in the whole process, but, but outside of the family. Because it's hard to be the family member who, who's that person, if you know what I mean. I know, I know exactly what you mean. It's hard to be the family carer and the doula at the same time. Um, yeah. Uh, very, very, because there's an awful lot of emotion involved. Um, and especially if you were given the job of looking after your mother. Um, I also know the difficulties that come along with that if you, if you do have sibling, siblings, because uh, it's all on you. Um, and that's a, that's, that's a heavy burden to carry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry you lost your mum um, and I'm yeah. sorry I'm sorry you had to go through that I'm sorry I wasn't there to help you <laughs> yeah I mean it, it was it was handled extremely well actually it was in St Vincent's Hospital they they handled it extremely well they couldn't have been better actually and more supportive and we did a lot of the stuff that you talked about with music and everything I mean I was they couldn't have been better but uh, it would have been even better I think if there was a doula there like you well, hopefully in the future, we'll have, we'll have, we'll have more, more doula-assisted doula, uh, um, well, end-of-life situations. 
Can I ask you a question then based on that? Um, you did mention that you'd offered your doula services to a hospice, but if somebody, let's say watching this evening, wants to maybe get in contact with you or another, like how do, do we just Google doulas in your area? Are, are there enough around the country that somebody could easily access one relatively easily? At the moment, well, we, we, we as a, uh, the doulas that are trained with Sacred Circle are setting up a website called irishdoulas.ie. But that's in that's all being done at the moment, but it's going to take a while for that to be up and running. Um, people might have noticed over the last few months, there have been a few interviews um, in national newspapers um, and on national radio with um, end of life doulas uh, from my circle. Um, so it, there's more and more talk uh, uh, about what a doula is and, and what a doula does. Um, as I said, I, I'll give you, uh, so you can put it up on, on, on your page. If you are looking for a doula in either England or Ireland, um, or in fact, I, I think there's also, uh, they're also in touch with uh, Europe and American doulas as well. Um, the email address, oh my goodness, is <laughs> sacred circle C i c at gmail.com and if you write an email to them they can put you in touch because they'll have a list of all the doulas that have done the training um and and where they are in the country so they'll be able to put you in touch with somebody near to you right thank um, you now we have more raised hands actually if you're okay to answer some more questions of course absolutely uh, the next hand is much more than uh, much more than please reveal yourself on mute your microphone uh, and you can ask Nikki your question. Hi, so, sorry, Ruth, it's Janie here. Um, I just couldn't, I can't change my name on, on your system. Um, good evening to everybody. Nikki, it's lovely to hear you speak. Uh, we, we've spoken uh, before. And I remember. I have absolute respect for, for what you do. I think it's a tremendous, tremendous uh, service to provide, uh, to, to have somebody who can hold a space and involve the family and allow the family to, to, to be in that process of saying goodbye without the responsibility, if you like, I think is, is a wonderful gift. Um, a couple of people on this call have, have prompted me to just draw their, uh, their, uh, everyone's attention to the fact that uh, we, we have two things going at the moment. One is the Advanced Healthcare Directive uh, which we've put up as a free download on endoflifeisland.ie. Uh, what we did was we took the living will, which nobody could get their hands on anymore, uh, reproduced it in a user-friendly format so it can be downloaded. And if somebody can't print out themselves, we will uh, post out a hard copy so they can just email uh, info at endoflifeisland.ie. The other thing that we have recently launched, people will be aware that the Dying with Dignity Bill has now, or the issue of voluntary assisted dying, has now been referred out of the Justice Department to a special committee which will be formed in the autumn. So as part of making sure it's not um, something that is, if you like, tossed out to the long grass, what we've done is we've set up a petition and I think somebody's put a link in there uh, for that. So what we want to do is just make the business committee who have to appoint, if you like, they're, they're responsible for establishing a special committee, put pressure on them to make sure they know that this is something that people want to see happening. Um, if you can't, if you can't access the link in the chat, if you go to Uplift and look under their campaigns, it's on there. And also we're putting it out on social media. But it is an important issue. I think everyone wants to learn more. And you're right with the interviews that are on the radio, with palliative care nurses, with uh, doulas, with what we're doing. I think people are starting to talk more about death and to actually use the words death and dying because people just haven't been comfortable with it. And yet it is part of life. So I think the more people know about what you're doing, the better. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Uh, that's Janie, actually. Now, I do have Jennifer oh, next. Janie, sorry. Sorry. Uh, no, yeah, and you're right. I have Jennifer next. Jennifer has a raised hand. Jennifer, if you would 
uh, unmute your microphone and you can ask Nikki your question there. Hi, Nikki, and um, thank you so, so much. It's been amazing, um, such an education. Um, from someone who has dealt with um, uh, going through the palliative care uh, system with a family member with just such a minefield and it would be um, it would have been amazing at the time to know that there were um, people like yourself available and I hope that it becomes um, the norm hopefully you'll be able to get the word out there so thank you so so much. I just have a quick quick question um, I saw that you said unwillingly you ended up officiating your friends um, uh, I suppose a ceremony, um, a, a death ceremony or, or whatever you, you had for him. Um, and you said you rambled at the time, you didn't really know what you were doing, but you did it and um, you kind of was left up to you. Is that something that you do? Do you work now as a funeral celebrant? Is it something that you do as well as a doula or an I don't. A cyber you don't. I don't. I, di I did it for, for Dave because he was my best friend and he yeah. didn't have anybody else. Um, and he definitely did not want any religious anything at all. Um, so I really, I, I really didn't know what else what else to do. Um, mm. I spoke to Massey's, the, the, the undertakers, um, and they actually told me that they had a non-religious celebrant available um, through their service, which was something I, I hadn't realized. But in the end, I thought, you, you know what? And I said, can I do it? Um, and they said, uh, well, you, you, yeah, you can. You don't, you don't have to have uh, a certification to be a celebrant. So um, anybody can officiate at, at a funeral. Okay. Uh, there's, you don't have to sign a register, um, you know. Um, I, did, I did have to go and register Dave's death as next of kin because his family left the country um, literally as soon as the coffin went into the into the crematorium and um, they they left um, and left the country and left me to deal with everything and um, so I, I was I was thrown in at the deep end that's that's how I learned really <laughs> I, I got a huge amount of very valuable experience from that experience and I wouldn't be afraid now of, of if it was somebody um if, if, if somebody asked me to do it I I would do it but it's not it's not a service that I offer in general Okay, thank you. And thank you again, Nikki. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. And Nikki, it would be remiss of me not to take this opportunity to say that the humanists do actually are, would be one of the group of people who do provide funeral services, secular funeral services. And uh, there's already, I think, maybe 30 people on the humanist website who do it. And I'm one of a group of 10 who are currently training to do funerals and also weddings and namings. And, and you touched on that idea of rites and rituals being missing and been taken away by organized religion. So I suppose you really are in the right place. Uh, you're, if you pardon the terrible accident when you're preaching to the converted from the point of view that, you know, rites and rituals are so important and need to be taken uh, into, back into our lives as such. Now, there's another raised hand. It's from Shaz this time. Um, Shaz, would you unmute your microphone and ask us your question, please? Hi, Nikki, I'm Shaz from North Wales been looking into different training for end of life companionship and I wonder what drew you to and um, doula rather than soul midwife or any of the other movements that are, that are going on well funnily enough um I was informed by somebody else that that is what I was um for a Guatemalan lady who, who's married to my cousin um ha, was over in Ireland um on her holidays and we had been talking, it, had, it wasn't long after my friend Dave had died and she knew uh, my involvement in previous funerals in the family and with friends. And she told me that I was a, a death doula, which sounds very dramatic. Uh, and some people prefer the term end of life doula. It sounds a little, mm. a little bit softer. Um, and and as, soon as, I, as soon as I heard the term, it's like something clicked in, in my head. And, and strangely enough, uh, I found training within a couple of weeks. It, it all fell into place um, very quickly for me. And uh, whereas I, I, something I'd never heard of before, all of a sudden there was training taking place that had never taken place in Ireland before. Um, and I managed to get um, onto that training course. Um, 
and I completed the training there and I'm still doing the training. It's a, you, you do a, a five day, um, I suppose you could call it a circle because we sit in circle um, to discuss the things that we need to discuss. Obviously, grief, mourning, uh, death in, in general. Uh, we learn an awful lot. Our teachers have been through hundreds and hundreds of, of deaths. Um, so they're hugely qualified to teach. Um, they're also amazing at holding space and they have the language um, of grief of grief. There, there is a there's a there's a specific language around grief um, that I'm not really very good at yet. Um, I've noticed though that 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 there's a very uh, a very gentle language that's used around grief and, and and I'm trying to learn a little bit more of that as I go. Um, I think they're the only people. There's a, there's a lady called Suzanne O'Brien um, in America, and she runs what she calls certified courses. Um, mm -hmm. But there are no recognized certifications um, for doulas, and it's two and a half thousand dollars, I think, to do her course. Now, um, the people that I, I uh, learned with Sacred Circle, they want to make the learning available for everybody. So um, they keep their they keep their their course prices down very low and also if you're not in a position to pay one large fee they will allow you to do it you know over 12 months or 24 months or, or whatever it is that that suits you and um, because they want to make sure that everybody who wants to get the training can have access to it and two of the ladies actually live in your part of the world that are uh the creators of sacred circle they're, yeah. they're from the, yeah <laughs> Um, so you probably find them easily enough if if you looked up doulas uh, and whales, you'll you'll probably find the ladies that I'm talking about. Okay, thank you very much, and, and thank well. you for joining us from uh, Wales. Um, they, oh, I see a comment here coming in from Paula Coughlin that several years ago the uh, the humanists did some chaplaincy training, uh, and they hope to continue this. Oh, in the memory of the late great Nick Johnson. Uh, the question has been asked, uh, is it expensive to hire an end of life doula? And I, I, can, I can I throw another question at you because there's another question I want to come to. Pat Comerford has his hand, is their hand up. Have you noticed that people never say someone died, they say that someone passed? Is this the way of trying to cover the reality? So the, the, the practicalities of it, what, what might the cost be? And then the language around death. Um, so the first thing again, sorry. Uh, the first thing was, Ed, the, the, um, I've confused myself now as to which one I went with first. Hold on, I'll open up the chat again. The first one Sorry. was, um, is it expensive to hire an end-of-life doula? So what might an estimated cost be? That all, depends on, that all depends on the case. It all depends on, on what the doula, if the doula is required on a full-time basis or merely for advice and support. Um, it's something that the doula will discuss with the family or, or or with the client um we don't like discussing it because if we could do it all for nothing we would and i i know i speak for every one of us when i say that if i could do it for everybody in the world i would do it uh, because because i would and <laughs> um, but obviously we have expenses and we have to travel um, and we do have expenses so we, we there has to be some sort of a nominal charge but they tend to everybody keeps the prices down as, as little as as possible um, and an awful lot of the time, um, especially if it's a if it's a poor family, we would we would just say you know any kind of donation that that you can afford is, is acceptable. Um, if somebody can't afford, I wouldn't turn them away from my door because they can't afford the service. Yeah. I would find some other way. I, I'd find some other way, a, a barter of some sort. Or okay, how oh, interesting. I'd find a way to 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 give them the work they need. Uh, and I think it was, uh, thank you for that. I think it was uh, Jean who messaged in uh, about saying that uh, people never say that, some people don't say that someone died, they say that someone passed. Uh, and I know you mentioned a bit earlier about the language of death. And uh, Jean asked the question, is this a way of trying to cover the reality? Is, is it people trying to be polite or what is it? No, it's more comforting, it's more a comforting word. Um, because death is so, that's it, you're, you're dead, you're gone, there, there's nothing else. Um, and everybody has different beliefs. Um, I, I, it's not the time to talk about beliefs now. Um, but everybody has a belief about what happens after they, after they die. Um, and depending on, on what their belief is, I suppose, um, 
is is the language they will tend to use. Um, I I tend to use the word um, died uh, uh, quite a lot because it, it's a it, it's a fact that person has died. But if you're if you're speaking or if you're informing a family member or if you're informing a loved one, um, it's softer and it's kinder to say that they've passed on because it gives the inference that they've they've passed on to something else, you know, um, whether whether that's what you believe or not, it, it gives that inference. So it's just a it's a kinder word to use. Okay, um, I'll ask Pat Comerford who has a raised hand. Uh, Pat, if you can unmute your mic and then you can direct your question to Nikki. Right. Uh, Nikki, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it really came across to me as truly humanistic but also very person-centered well, okay. My question to you is that, what are relations like between doulas and those of the medical profession who vicariously do promote a, a death phobia uh, approach in their work? It can be yeah. very complicated. <laughs> Um, they don't like they they don't they don't like people telling you uh, telling them that, that that things don't have to be this way, but if if a person has decided that they don't want to continue with care, for example, mm. and and they don't have the energy to fight with their doctors about that, I will I, I will ensure that their care is discontinued, and um, because I I am an advocate for that person. And that person will have given the doctors notice that I am their advocate and that what I what I say they 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 need to listen to. So you're given an advocacy by the, the client. That's good to hear. Um, um, it, it enables so, you then to to converse with with the medicals about care. So as such, the medical profession are not open to the very important role that you provide as end of life companions. No, I'd have to. I I disagree to their part. Is that, um, no, I'm just wondering. Yeah, no, a lot, a, a lot of uh, a lot of doctors that are aware of our service are very grateful for our service because oh, there's less dealing with uh, upset family members, um, who scream and roar at them and demand things that can't be done, and um, it 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 takes away the um the very high emotion that comes with um the death of a loved one. And speaking with the doctor, um, it's just good to have somebody that isn't emotionally invested in that way, because also they will remember everything that the doctor says. <laughs> Whereas um, anybody who's been through a bereavement will know that when the doctor's talking to you, it goes in one ear and straight out the other. And unless you're writing it down at the time, I, I, you're just not going to remember what they say. So it's just, it's, it's a good advocate. It's good to have somebody advocating for you, I think, outside of your family, um, that is. Great service that you provide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for your question. Um, I wonder, it may be time to finish up soon, but Nikki, if I could ask a question, how do you separate having such empathy with people from the practical things of you need to leave and get on with your life, you may have gotten very attached to somebody. How do you self care in that situation? Well, that's all. That's all part of the training. Um, I have people that I can speak to. I have a circle of people um, that if 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 something gets upsetting, they all know exactly what I'm going through. Um, so I have 24 wonderful people that that I can turn to in times of need. I also have two very important people in my life that uh, I can lean on if I need extra support. Um, but gen generally, I, I tend to find that um, once my job, once my job is done, you see, I still usually have some contact with the family afterwards. Um, check ins, I check in on people and make sure that they're doing OK or whatever. And sometimes they'll stay in your life and sometimes they won't. Um, but I think it's the same as in any caring profession that you, there is a certain there is a certain detachment that 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 you do have to encourage in yourself, I suppose, because it, it is. It's, I mean, it's the most emotional thing that anybody goes through in their life is is dying, um, or being born, 
so so uh, it's hugely emotional for everybody and, and the doulas have been known to shed a tear or two too uh, at somebody's death you know at a client's death and um, it's perfectly natural but we've learned um we've learned through circle how to deal with that grief and how to express that grief right uh, at this point i would like to say oh eamon had just put his hand up just in the nick of time eamon <laughs> eamon unmute yourself there and uh this will be, I, I think this may need to be the last question, but Eamon, if you unmute your microphone, you'll have time to ask uh, Nikki the last question of the night. Eamon? I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, sorry, um, it's actually Sinead. Um, I'm under my husband's, but um, I just want to say, Nikki, it's a fabulous talk. And I suppose what you just said there was somebody had just mentioned about, you know, how you detach yourself from you know, the service that you give with the people. I'm actually a nurse myself. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the one thing that I learned was that, you know, you can't change what's happening for the person, but you can make such a big difference in their life. And how I heard about the doula recently was through a friend who had miscarriages. And I had never heard about it in the past. So I started reading up about it. So Nikki, what you do is amazing and keep up the good work. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. That's very kind words. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. And thank you for listening to the talk this evening, everybody that's attended. Um, thank you very much. We're anxious to get the word out uh, about doulas because I think, especially at the moment, we have an awful lot to offer the world. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, um, so at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Tony. Um, that's great, Ruth. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, sorry, Nikki, just before we finish, um, we did have another question that just came in. It's from Gerard, and it's, are there LGBTQ doulas who may have had negative experiences when religion became involved? Um, elderly, say that again? Sorry, LGBTQ doulas um, who may have had negative experiences when religion became involved. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Everybody talks about the world being woke these days. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, not everybody is, is as woke as, as we would like. Um, and you're going to get prejudices, um, especially, uh, especially in religion. Um, there's, no, there's no denying that because everything that they stand for is, is, is against everything that the other side stands for, really. Um, that, that, that's something... That's a very good question. I'm not quite sure how to answer that because I haven't come across it myself as of yet. Um, there are a number of members of the LGBTQ community that are doulas. Um, my, um, a couple of my friends are, are members of the LGBTQ community and uh, any kind of prejudice at all uh, towards any human is not acceptable in my eyes, which is why religion is... It, I have such a, a difficulty with uh, organized religion personally. Um, but what I, what I would say um, to anybody that's in that position is, um, is pay no, you just pay no attention to the man in the black dress. <laughs> I love it, Nikki. Thanks so much. And I'm going to be very cheeky now and just slip in a little question of my own. Um, I, heard, I read a lovely story about um, a doula and what she helped the, the lady that she was a caregiver for put together a book of recipes that the woman's children were brought up on. And it would have been, it would have been too emotive for the woman to do them. She didn't want to upset her kids. Yeah. And, and of course, doing it on her own, uh, the doula gave her that emotional support to be able to go ahead and write down all the recipes that well, these are all the little, it's, the little kind of things that, yeah, that we can help with, that we can help with. I mean, it goes far beyond. I'm sorry for interrupting. Oh God, sorry. No, I was just, um, I was just wondering, is it, would, is it a thing that the, a doula would suggest, make suggestions, um, to the person that they're looking after? In other well, words, have you thought about putting together a book of recipes, or if, uh, getting all the old photos together, and we'll put together an album, and it, I'll pass it on to your loved ones after. Oh, there's all, 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 all kinds of suggestions. Uh, okay. There's also an awful lot of things available now. Um, like before, before your loved one dies, you can get hand casting done of, of your, your hands held together, which is actually very beautiful. Um, this is a new thing that's come up now. And a friend of mine has, has had it done for a couple of her clients. Um, and they've absolutely loved it because it's such a beautiful memento of your, your mom or your, or your aunt or whatever or whoever it is that, that, that may have died. 
Um, yeah, there, there are loads of suggestions. Um, that's the whole point is that there are so many things that you can do. Um, so many things that you can do that people just can't think about when, when they're faced with the imminent death of a loved one. Uh, uh, coherent thought goes out the window at, at that time. And you know, I suppose, so having somebody around you who has uh, some idea of what's going on and what they're doing, it, it, it really does. It, it, it makes things a lot easier, an awful lot easier. Absolutely. And we just had a comment in actually from Nadine. Um, my nephew had that son before he died with his mum and dad. And sisters. Hand casting. Yeah. So that's yeah, it's a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing to do. Okay. I think uh, we're it's at 10 to 9. I think we'll wrap it up there. Nikki, I can't thank you enough. It's been a really, it's been an incredible meeting. And the the information that you brought to us this evening is, is incredible, fantastic, really is. Mm -hmm.